is Kim Garrett, and I'm a graduate student employee at the University of Pittsburgh. How many grads do we have in the audience? How many of you hope to one day be graduate students? Yeah! Awesome. I'm a doctoral student in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health. My colleagues and I study the intricate relationships between human health and the environment. I study poisons like cyanide and sulfide. Workers in many industries risk exposure to these toxins every day, and my lab is working on finding new, fast-acting antidotes. <laughs> Environmental safety and health are central to both my research and my personal life. As a Pittsburgher with asthma, I know that the connection between the air and my health is impossible to ignore. Locally, I see industrial giants ignore the lungs and lives of communities. I see local healthcare businesses cripple their workers with medical debt. <laughs> I see my own university profit from the work of graduate students who struggle to pay their rent and afford food. My colleagues and I organize because we know the value of our work. Some of us develop life-saving medicines, others the technology to create tomorrow's green jobs. We write history books, predict and prevent epidemics, and design sustainable infrastructure. Along with our research, we attend classes and teach classes of our own. We do this while taking care of children, elderly parents, and last of all, ourselves. We are coming together as a union to demand fairness and transparency in how decisions are made at Pitt. We are rising together. <laughs> we are rising together to demand freedom from exploitation. We demand comprehensive access to health and child care. And in the face of Trump's attacks on Title IX, we demand access to protection from discrimination and violence. Thank you. A legally binding union contract will give us the security that we need to thrive and continue to do our research that will make the world a better place. We're proud to be a part of a resurgence of the labor movement in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> we are rising up alongside teachers, tradespeople, fast food, grocery store, and hospital workers. <laughs> Strong. <laughs> Strong campaigns and union actions don't limit themselves to regular business hours. As we demand safety in our workplaces, we must demand safety in our home, neighborhoods, and on our planet. <laughs> Robust organizations of workers are the strongest tools we have to fight for our goals, and we need political leadership that fights alongside working people. Senator Bernie Sanders has continuously stood up for workers throughout his career, and we are so proud. Yeah. And we are so proud to have his support for our campaign. While we may be in different industries, all of us, we are all workers. As graduate student employees, we generate wealth and prestige for the university, yet struggle to pay for basic necessities. But when we harness our collective power, we will win dignity, fairness, and safer, healthier working conditions. And when we take this power to the streets, we can win the same for our communities and planet. Uh, before I wrap up, I have a favor to ask of all of you. Take out your phones, open a browser, go to usw.to slash election info. And if you are a graduate student or a graduate employee at Pitt, make sure to make a plan to vote union yes. If you aren't a grad but know someone who is, please share this link and remind them to make a plan to vote. Thank you to Bernie Sanders for inviting me to speak on behalf of the Pitt Graduate Student Organizing Committee and for standing with us throughout our campaign. Thank you also to the United Steelworkers for their invaluable support. <laughs> and
and for listening to us when we first sought out your help. This four-year-long fight is almost finished, and I hope that every grad here today will vote yes for our union during our election next week. As grads together, I believe that we will win. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, mother of three and UPMC worker in the Presby Pathology Department fighting to make UPMC recognize her union, Neela Payton. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage union activist Al Hart. I decided while I was getting ready to come up here that for today at least we should change the name of this city. So, good afternoon, Pittsburgh! I'm Al Hart. I live here in Pittsburgh in Stanton Heights. I'm retired, but I'm active in a number of organizations here in Pittsburgh, including the Pittsburgh Chapter of Democratic Socialists of America, and a new political action committee called Unite that's recruiting more progressive, radical candidates to run for office. I've been a labor activist for the past 45 years in the United Electrical Workers, better known as UE. Um, I live in Pittsburgh now, but I grew up in Erie, and it, that's, that's an important place right now. Um, I started my labor career as a rank-and-file worker in the GE plant in Erie, uh, where I joined the union, later became a shop steward and a member of the executive board. Uh, since 1986, after 1986, for 30 years I worked as a union rep for the around various places around the country and eventually ended up here in Pittsburgh. Uh, you may have heard about my plant in Erie 
um, and the struggle that's going on there. The General Electric plant in Erie has built locomotives for 100 years, and a few months, months ago, a Pittsburgh company, Wabtec, the old Westinghouse Air Brake Company, bought, West, bought GE Transportation. And the fight right now is over Wabtec's attempt to gut the wages, the benefits, and the working conditions that members of my union established over the last 82 years. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. It has, it has to do with Bernie. My union has a long relationship with Bernie Sanders. We have, we have a number of locals in Vermont. And Bernie Sanders has supported our locals in Vermont in every struggle they've been involved in, whether it was a political struggle, a collective bargaining struggle, or a struggle to organize, since the 1980s when he was mayor of Burlington. In, a few years ago, I was editor of the union's newspaper. And in 2008, I, something came in for us to publish on the paper that kind of surprised me. It was a photograph and a little information about an organizing campaign we were running in, Bur in, in um, St. Albans, Vermont, and it was a photograph of a United States senator attending an organizing meeting to explain to workers why they should join the union. And I think you all know who that senator was. I don't think there's another person in the United States Senate that would do that. I've never heard of it. I've never heard of any politician actually helping in organizing campaigns. And I was kind of surprised by this, but then some other people in the union that had been in Vermont or were from Vermont told me, this is nothing new. Bernie's been doing this for us for years. Every time we have an organizing campaign, even when he was just a mayor, he would show up and talk to the workers about the benefits of joining the union. Bernie Sanders is a union organizer. And besides being a union organizer, he's someone who, doesn't, who, who, who walks the picket lines. He's been involved in many strikes. He shows up on the picket lines and supports the workers. In the fight we're involved in Erie right now, our members went out on strike at the end of February for nine days. And they may be going back out on strike again in June. We got an interim agreement that's acceptable for 90 days, but we don't know what's going to happen after June 3rd. Um, and it's not looking that good right now. But Bernie stepped in even before the people went on strike. He was putting out information nationally about the issues in that strike and why it was a struggle for the right of workers and all workers of this country, but particularly manufacturing workers who build some very complex, you know, products to earn a living wage and work and live and work in dignity. And Bernie made Bernie made a strike in little old Erie, Pennsylvania, a national cause. When we had a rally at the Wabtec plant here in Wilmerding, which is also the corporate headquarters, Bernie sent out texts to every contact he had in, in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, some of you must have got those texts to help us build turnout for the rally we had in Wilmerding, where we also represent the workers in that plant in UE Local 610. So Bernie, is there. Bernie doesn't talk about being a supporter of labor. He does it. He helped us every step of the way in this fight. Um, I've never seen another politician do this. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a politician back labor the way he does. One more thing I want to say, since I'm also up, there, up here as the old guy. Um, I'm retired. I have a pretty good retirement. I got a little bitty pension from GE from the time I worked for them in the 80s and 70s and 80s. I get a decent pension from my union. I get Social Security. I'm the last of a dying breed. People my age can't afford to retire. People the age of a lot of you out there, it looks like you'll never be able to afford to retire because pensions have been destroyed and Social Security is not enough to live on. Um, my union did a, we had kind of a task force about 10 years ago to look into what was happening to our members and throughout the whole country to two things, health care and the right to retire. And, you know, the picture is, was very bad then and it's worse now. And we concluded two things. Number one, we absolutely cannot save decent health insurance at the bargaining table. We're losing ground every time we negotiate a contract on health care. We need single-payer Medicare for all health care. And nobody has fought harder for that than Bernie Sanders in Washington, D.C. 
But as he always says, it's not me, it's us, and it's all of us that have to make these changes. The other thing we have to change, of course, is the, right, is, is the right to organize our union, which is almost non-existent in this country. There are so many obstacles that the law allows employers to put in the path of workers. That's the reason the number of workers in unions keeps declining. People want to join a union, but it's too hard for them to do it. And Bernie has been in the forefront of the fight, pushing legislation, which I'm sure he'll be able to do a lot more with as president, to restore the right to join a union. But the other, the other right that we've, that we've lost, and some, some people, a lot of people never had the right, is the right to retire in dignity and in comfort. And Bernie has, has been pushing the, the thing that our union is for, which is to double or more than double the amount of benefits that Social Security pays so that people can retire on Social Security alone and live comfortably. So let me just end by saying that I, you know, Bernie Sanders is a guy I mean, we've, I've never seen a candidate like him in my lifetime for president who is more pro-working class than him. I think we've never seen a candidate like, like with his positions with a serious chance of winning the presidency in the history of the United States. And I believe that Bernie can win in 2020 and that he will win. And it sounds like you agree with me. So let's get to work and make that happen. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from San Juan, Puerto Rico, co-chair of the Bernie 2020 campaign, Mayor Jolene Cruz. Hello, Pittsburgh. How are you? You know, it is very special for me to be here today for two reasons. One, I went to school at Carnegie Mellon University. Two, 29 years ago this November, I gave birth to my only child, my daughter Marina at McGee Women's Hospital. So this is like coming home for me. And number three, out of a debt that I had to pay, a debt of gratitude to the people of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You see, September 20th, 2017, San Juan and Puerto Rico were changed forever. Two devastating hurricanes really ripped us apart. And rather than finding words of comfort, rather than standing up to the task, the President of the United States neglected all of us. He made sure, he made sure that the people that needed help didn't get the help. You can, kill, you can kill people with a gun or you can kill people with neglect. And 3,000 Puerto Ricans died because President Trump did not have it in him to get the job done. People ask me why that happens. It may be because he's racist. It may be because he doesn't have a clue. He actually said that the reason why the United States could not get help to Puerto Rico was because we were an island surrounded by water. Lots and lots of water, ocean water. But when the time came, I spoke words that came out of my heart. I said, we are dying here and you are killing us with your incompetence, your bureaucracy and your inefficiency and the people of the United States heard the call. Right here from Pittsburgh, Brothers Keepers, Pitt students, Carnegie Mellon students, and just the regular folks all over the United States came out to tend to our wounds. You see, we didn't, we didn't want electricity to take hot baths or have air conditioner. We wanted electricity so that Doctors did not have to go to the hospital table and operate on people with a light on their cell phone. This man turned his back on us, but the people of the United States, the unions in the United States, tended to our wounds, fed us, gave us water, and let us know that we were not alone. So let's give it for the unions.
young people from Pittsburgh went to Puerto Rico to care for us. So I want to give a shout out to the students at Pitt University who are fighting a great fight, one fight that we should all fight with them, to have the right to have a union that would defend them. Uh, I'll tell you another thing. What do you need when things are not going right? You need somebody that will get the job done. We need a leader, say it with me, that will get the job done. Bernie Sanders didn't start talking about Medicare for all because it was sexy or because it was politically convenient. He started talking about Medicare for all because it is the right thing to do. And when you, I, and us get him to the White House, he will get the job Say it like you mean it. Come on. He, he didn't start supporting unions now because it's the electoral cycle. He's done it all his life. So when he's in the White House, Bernie will get... He didn't start thinking that education as a great equalizer was going to be the one that will permit upward mobility for people to get them out of poverty, to let them know that they are equal in every single right because Bernie Sanders will get... But in order for him to do it, we have to organize. We have to get out of here today and make sure that on your street, at school, on your job, you tell people over and over and over that this country, these United States, need a leader that can get the job done. Y si hay alguien por ahí que habla español, sabe que para los latinos es importante que Bernie Sanders sea el próximo presidente de los Estados Unidos. Because you see, when it comes to discrimination, Bernie didn't start the fight on this electoral cycle. He's doing it because it's the right thing to do. So if you want to get somebody to the White House to get... There's only one name and one name only. There's only one name and one name only. There's only one name and one name only. Say it loud! Say it loud! One man that will look at all of us, no matter what the color of our skin, no matter what language we speak, no matter who we grew up with, no matter who we love, will look at all of us the same way. It won't matter to him if you're a member of the LGBTQ community. It won't matter to him if you're a transgender trying to serve this country in the military. It won't matter to him if you are somebody that came to this country, didn't know that you weren't born here, and now you're a DACA student and this is the only country that you know. What will matter to him is that your heart is in the right place. Now the world is looking. The world is watching. The world saw when President Trump went down to Puerto Rico and threw paper towels at us. His idea of helping was throwing paper towels. His idea of not getting the job done was blaming those who were suffering. He did it in Puerto Rico. He's done it in Pine Ridge. He's done it in California. For the young people out there, do not let anybody else decide for you what your future and your present will look like. If you want someone that will get the job done, there's only one name and one name only. Say it out loud. Say it like you mean it. Thank you, Pittsburgh. Ladies and gentlemen. Let's join the revolution and let's do it together. Let's go. One name to get. Thank you very much. Que Dios lo bendiga. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, co-chair of the Bernie 2020 campaign, Senator Nina Tur Baby, 
I want to thank the mayor for that because there is only one person who's going to get the job done, baby. I got to give a shout out to our other two co-chairs who were, are not here today, but they're here in spirit. Congressman Ro Khanna from the great state of California. And then the humanitarian chief ice cream maker himself, Ben Cohen from Ben and Jerry's. But Mayor Cruz and I, we're bringing the co-chair girl power together. Is that all right? And Pittsburgh, let me go into my purse and get my notes. Wow. It is so beautiful to see all of you here. Can everybody hear me way in the back? Raise your hand, baby. Okay. So let's take care of some heart-wrenching business. Antoine Rose. Justice for Antoine. Justice for Antoine. Now we all know that Antoine Rose was shot in the back and justice has not been served. But Pittsburgh as a community, we need to stand with his mother and the rest of his family and come together for justice. We, we cannot let his death be in vain. Now we can't just talk about that, we got to be about that. So can we just have just a moment of silence and reflection on the loss of life of a 17 year old unarmed African American man, young man, who was shot in the back. A moment of silence please. Thank you, Pittsburgh. Thank you, Pittsburgh. So I bring you word this afternoon by two folks in our history. One is Congresswoman Barbara Jordan, and the other one is President Teddy Roosevelt. Congresswoman Barbara Jordan said these words. She said, what the people want is simple, very simple. They want an America as good as its promise. That's not asking too much. President Teddy Roosevelt put it this way. He said, this country will not be a good place for any of us to live in unless we make it a good place for all of us to live in. It is on those two quotes that I base my remarks this afternoon about a champion for justice by the name of Bernard Sanders. He's been fighting the fight for what is just, for what is right, and for what is good for a very long time. And we got the receipts going back 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. He is not new to this. And so when you are a visionary, sometimes you are very much ahead of the curve. And that is Senator Sanders, that's his MO. He is a first generation college graduate. His lived experience informs him. His father was an immigrant from Poland coming to this country at the young age of 17 years old to escape the Holocaust. Senator Bernie Sanders understands what it means to try to come to this country for a better life. And for those of us who live in this country right now seeking a better life. His mother died at a very young age. She was only 46 years old. Him and his brother and his parents, they lived in rent control housing in Brooklyn. You may say, s &T, why are you telling us this? I'm telling you this because we need to understand the measure of the man. He has a lived experience that helps him to understand, hashtag, that the struggle is showing up real. He gets it. And his mother's dream, her hope 
was to own a home of her, to own a home, but she did not live long enough to see that dream realized. Senator Sanders understands that when you have to live paycheck to paycheck, when you're struggling every day, that it is hard, sometimes gut-wrenching, to see a better day tomorrow. And that is why he is standing up to a rigged system against the working class people of this country. And, you know, he just don't talk about these things. He is about these things. And it's not just what he did at the age of 19 years old. Shout out to my millennials and my Gen Zs. He was on the front lines. Can I, can I shout? I got to shout out the boomers and the exes, too. I ain't going to leave nobody out. Let me shout them out. But Senator Sanders lived experience. He won't sell you out, and you can take that to the bank. He can't be bought off. I mean, who stands up and tells Jeff Bezos, you must pay your workers $15 an hour? <laughs> Senator Sanders. Who tells Disney, that's supposed to be the happiest place on earth, that Minnie Mouse and Mickey Mouse and Goofy are not that happy because you're not paying your workers a living wage? Who does that? Stands up with Verizon workers on the picket line and Marriott workers on the picket lines. Senator Bernie Sanders does that. His lived experience is why he understands that we cannot continue on the path that we are on right now. And sisters and brothers, we don't begrudge people from having some wealth. Having wealth is, is, is a good thing. Listen, I was born poor. I'm not trying to die poor. But what we are sick, I mean, that's, that's, that's real. But what we are sick and tired of is excessive greed and exploitation on the necks and the backs of the working people of this country. We tired of it. And we're not going to take it anymore. So we need to elect a champion. And I want you to watch all the other Senator Sanders. He sets the pace. My God, we got over a million people signed up to help this campaign all across this country. We're going to win this. Over a million donations so far. We're going to win this. Before Senator Sanders set the tone, most candidates would be sitting in rooms with wealthy donors begging and asking them for money. But because of 2016, now the candidates trying to figure out how many people power donors do they have. It is because Senator Sanders set that tone, baby. And we are going to win this race. Not not by the might of corporate interest, but by the might of the people. And you are those people. People power. And sisters and brothers, if all of us are willing to put a little extra on our ordinary, extraordinary things will and do happen. It is because of you and 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 you. It is us. We're going to make this thing happen. So sisters and brothers, can you do something for a sister? I want you to raise one hand for yourself, another hand for somebody else. We are in this together. And with these hands, sisters and brothers, we will have Medicare for all. With these hands, we will have college for all. With these hands, women will finally get their whole damn dollar. With these hands, we will have comprehensive immigration reform. With these hands, we will reform a criminal justice system that is rotten to the core. Baby, with these hands, we will have transcendence in this country. And if you believe, like I believe, if you know, like I know, that we got to put some sweat equity on this thing to make it happen, with these hands, we will elect Senator Bernie Sanders, the next president of the United States 
of America. be a small turnout. Looks like that's not the case. Let me thank Wild Blue Yonda for their music. Let me thank Danielle Paston. Let me thank Kimberly Garrett. Let me thank Nyla Payton for her remarks. Let me thank Alan Hart. And let me thank my very good friend, Mayor Carmen Yulee Cruz of San Juan. There is a reason why Mayor Cruz is Trump's least favorite mayor. And that's because she is a woman of integrity and courage. And she is standing up for her people and not afraid to take on Trump's racism. And let me thank Sister Nina Turner. Nina is doing some of the most important work in this country. She is running all over our nation, organizing, getting people involved in the political process, getting people prepared to stand up and fight for justice. Thank you, Nina. Now, this weekend, I'm here in Pennsylvania, and I've been to Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, and Ohio. And the reason we are visiting these states is pretty simple. Donald Trump won them two and a half years ago. We are not going to let him win them in 2020. We are going to win in Pennsylvania. We're going to win in Michigan. We're going to win in Wisconsin. We're going to win in Indiana and Ohio. And by the way, we're going to win the election. And one of the reasons that we're going to win here in Pennsylvania and other states is that I think that people increasingly understand that in a democracy, we all have differences of opinions. And that's natural and that's a good thing. But what we should not be having for a president is somebody who is a pathological liar. And whether you are a progressive, a moderate, or a conservative, you do not want somebody who lies all of the time to lead this country. Now, Donald Trump has told literally thousands of lies since he began his campaign and since he has been in the White House. But the biggest lie that he told the people of Pennsylvania and the people of Vermont and people all across this country, the biggest lie was that he was going to stand up for working families and take on the establishment. That was a monstrous lie. And let me give you just a few examples. As many of you recall, 
here in Pennsylvania, Trump came through the state and he said, I will guarantee health care to everybody. Remember that? Well, as President Trump did exactly the opposite. Instead of guaranteeing health care to everybody, he supported legislation that would throw 32 million Americans off of the health care they currently have. And that legislation would do away with the protections for people who have pre-existing conditions. It would do away with the coverage for people 26 years of age or younger to be on their parents' insurance policies. So we say to President Trump, throwing 32 million people off of health insurance is not standing up for working families. It is betraying them. Some of you may recall Trump said, hey, I'm a different type of Republican. I'm not going to cut Medicare or Medicaid or Social Security. It will not shock you to learn that he lied. I know that that's a shock, but he did. In his last budget, he proposed a trillion and a half dollar cut to Medicaid an $845 billion cut to Medicare and billions in cuts to Social Security. Now, when Donald Trump ran for president, he came to Pennsylvania and said, we are going to pass tax reform that will not benefit the wealthy. Remember that? Well, he lied again. Turns out that 83% of the benefits of his tax bill over a 10-year period go to the top 1%. And by the way, anybody here happen to know how much Amazon paid in taxes last year? So here you have a major corporation making over $10 billion dollars in profit, owned by the wealthiest person in the country, and because of Trump's tax bill, paid zero in federal income taxes. But it's not just Amazon, it's General Motors, Chevron, IBM, Eli Lilly, and many, many other major corporations. Trump promised, as you may recall, that he would substantially reduce the trade deficit. That's right. <laughs> he was laughing in case you missed it. And he would prevent the outsourcing of American jobs abroad. But since Trump has been president, the trade deficit has gone up by $120 billion, and his own Labor Department certified that 185,000 American jobs have been shipped abroad under his watch. And the NAFTA treaty that Trump renegotiated with Mexico will still allow companies like General Motors to send our jobs to Mexico. So today, I challenge Donald Trump for once in your life, keep a campaign promise. Go back to the drawing board on NAFTA. Do not send this treaty to Congress unless it includes strong and swift enforcement mechanisms to raise the wages of workers and to prevent corporations from shutting down in America and going abroad. Now, during his campaign, and I remember that TV ad, Trump said he was going to stand up to Wall Street. And he was going to reinstate the Glass-Steagall Act. 
But as President, Trump signed legislation into law to deregulate Wall Street and provide large financial institutions with a massive tax cut. Trump's tax plan increased bank profits by nearly $25 billion, allowing them to make record-breaking profits. Hey, Mr. Trump, you're not standing up to Wall Street when you deregulate the banks and lay the groundwork for another bailout. Now, today, in what turns out to be a surprisingly beautiful day, I am delighted to welcome you to a campaign which is not only going to win the great state of Pennsylvania, is not only going to win the Democratic nomination, is not only going to defeat Donald Trump, the most dangerous president in modern American history, but with your help, we are going to transform this country and create a government and an economy that works for all of us, not just the 1%. So today, I welcome you to a campaign which says, with confidence and with love, that the underlying principles of our government will not be greed, will not be kleptocracy, will not be hatred, and will not be lies. The underlying principles of our government will not be racism, will not be sexism, will not be homophobia, or religious bigotry. Those ugly anti-American sentiments are going to end, and they're going to end soon. Now, we have, we have a very different vision for the future of America than Donald Trump has. The principles of our government will be based on justice, economic justice, social justice, yeah. racial justice, yeah. and environmental justice. Yeah. Now, it is no great secret that Donald Trump and his friends want to divide us up. They want to divide us up based on the color of our skin based on where we were born, based on our religion or our sexual orientation. Well, we got news for Mr. Trump. Instead of dividing the American people up, this campaign and our government is about bringing people together. Black and white and Latino, Native American, Asian American, gay and straight, native born and immigrants. This is a solidarity movement. We are all in it together. And when I talk about being in it together, I'm thinking about that working class family in Pittsburgh or Burlington, Vermont, that cannot afford to send their kids to quality 
childcare. When we are in it together, I'm thinking about the woman I met yesterday in Detroit who said there are 200 vacancies for teachers in the Detroit school system because they don't have enough money to pay their teachers a decent wage. When we talk about solidarity, we're talking about lives being destroyed because of a broken and racist criminal justice system. When we talk about solidarity, we're talking about undocumented people in this country scared to death about being arrested tomorrow and deported. When we talk about solidarity, we're talking about the families in Pennsylvania and in Vermont and in California who are forced to work two or three jobs just to keep their heads above water economically. So no, no, we're not going to let Trump divide us up. We're going to come together and address the real crises facing this country and create an economy that works for all of us. And when we talk about justice, we have the guts to talk about issues that very few people in Congress or in the media will talk about. And that is, we will not accept the massive levels of income and wealth inequality that exist in America today. It is not acceptable to us that three wealthy families own more wealth in this country than the bottom half of the American people, 160 million Americans. And meanwhile, while the very rich get richer, 20% of our children live in poverty. This is America. We should not be having the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major country on earth. With the rich getting very richer, we should not be tolerating veterans who put their lives on the line to defend us sleeping out on the streets. That is not justice, not what America is about. Justice means that we will not accept 49% of all new incomes going to the top 1%. at the same time as 40 million Americans are living in poverty and over half of our people are living paycheck to paycheck. Now, I grew up in a family that lived paycheck to paycheck, and I know what that is about. And what that is about is if today your car breaks down and you don't have the money to repair that car, and you can't get to work, and if you can't get to work, you get fired, and if you get fired, you can't take care of your kids. That's what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck. And what living paycheck to paycheck is about is a fear that maybe your kid or your parents might get sick and end up in the hospital, and in order to pay that bill, you're going to go bankrupt. This is America. This is the richest country in the history of the world. And millions and millions of people should not be finding themselves in desperate economic conditions. And justice means that today we got a message to corporate America. And what justice is about is ending a process by which the CEOs of major corporations are now making over 300 times as much as their average worker. That is not justice. That is corporate greed. And together, we're going to end that. Justice means that we will no longer accept a situation 
in which the 25 top hedge fund managers in this country earn twice as much money as all of the kindergarten teachers in the United States of America. Can you imagine that? Kindergarten teachers take money out of their own pockets to buy supplies for their children, and 25 hedge fund managers earn double the income of all kindergarten teachers. And when we talk about bringing justice to America, let's be very clear. By that, we mean ending racial injustice in our country. At a time, at a time of overall massive levels of disparity within the United States, the situation is much, clear, much worse for black families. It is not acceptable that black families today own one-tenth of the wealth of white families. That the infant mortality rate in the African-American community is two and a half times higher than in the white community. That redlining in housing continues to exist that black businesses cannot get the loans they need at affordable rates, that black school districts are underfunding. So when we talk about justice, we say in a very profound sense that we will end institutional racism in all of its ugly forms. And let me say a word to the young people who are here and the young people of Pennsylvania. We are living in a moment in history where we have seen, as you all know, an explosion in technology and in worker productivity. And yet, unless we turn this around for the first time in the modern history of our country, our younger generation will have a lower standard of living than their parents. I have four kids and seven grandchildren. Downward mobility is not acceptable to me, and it's not acceptable to the American people. This campaign is about moving people up, not down. And when we talk about justice, it's not just economic justice. It is ending a corrupt political system. And here is a radical idea. You want to hear a radical idea? How about a political system which is about one person, one vote, not a... I know that's a radical idea, and not about billionaires buying elections. So yes, together, together we are going to overturn that disastrous... Supreme Court decision on Citizens United. Yes, we are going to move toward public funding of elections. And yes, we are going to put an end to voter suppression in this country. You know, it really galls me that you have Republican governors and attorneys general who are so afraid of free and fair elections that the only way they think they can win is by making it harder for people of color or poor people or young people to vote. So I say to those cowardly governors, if you don't have the guts 
to participate in free and open elections. Get the hell out of politics. And get a new job. Now, all of you will recall that during the 2015-2016 campaign, very few people took our campaign seriously, to say the least. And the ideas, and this is important because it talks about how change comes about. The ideas that we were talking about then were described by the mainstream media and the establishment politicians. They said that those ideas were too radical, too extreme. Those were ideas that the American people would never, ever accept. Well, when we talked about raising the minimum wage to a living wage, our opponents said, too radical. Now, here is, you're ready for another radical idea. All right. Hold on to your hats. I don't want people fainting because this is really a radical idea. We talked, ready for this? about health care as a human right, not a privilege. And we were told by the establishment, health care is a human right. That is not an American idea too radical. And then we said, you know, we can create up to 15 million good-paying jobs by rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure with a trillion-dollar investment. Oh, Bernie, a trillion dollars. We can't afford it much to... And then I remember, like it was yesterday, I was on a... Uh, on a national televised, nationally televised debate. And the moderator said, well, Senator Sanders, what do you consider to be the major national security threat that the country faces? And he expected to me say, he expected me to say Al-Qaeda or ISIS or terrorism. And what I said, the major national security threat we face is climate change. And four years ago, four years ago, when I said that, people literally laughed. Well, they ain't laughing now. And when, when we talked about criminal justice and the need to reform a broken system, we said one of the things we have got to do is end the war on drugs and legalize marijuana. Oh, Bernie, you can't do that. Oh, my God, the world will fall apart if you legalize marijuana. Well, in case you haven't noticed, a lot of states are now doing just that. And then when we said that maybe candidates should run for office and run for president without being dependent on super PACs funded by billionaires, we were told, hey, Bernie, that's the way it's always been. Don't you know that rich people are the people who control American politics? And when we talked about ending the power of superdelegates at the Democratic National Convention, and maybe ending a system in which one candidate had 500 superdelegates, 
before the first vote was cast. Well, we were told that that idea was too radical as well. Well, brothers and sisters, a funny thing has happened over the last four years. In 2016, it turned out that we won 22 states around the country. We won 13 million votes. Over 1,700 delegates at the Democratic National Convention. And most importantly, for the future of this country and for what we stand for, we ended up winning more votes from young people, black and white and Latino, Native American, Asian American. We won more votes from young people than Trump and Clinton combined. And by the way, by the way, and by the way, the ideas that we talked about four years ago that seemed so very radical at that time, well, today, virtually all of those ideas are supported by a majority of the American people. And they are ideas that Democratic candidates from school board to president of the United States now support. In other words, we have come a long way in the last few years. And what that change is about is what American history is all about. And that is the understanding that real change never takes place from the top on down, always from the bottom on up. And that is, that is the history of the labor movement in America. And that is when workers stood up and they said, we're sick and tired of being exploited, overworked and underpaid. We are going to engage in collective bargaining and have a union. When people stood up and fought back, they got a union. And that is the history of the civil rights movement in this country. And that is when millions of Americans, black and white, stood up and said, we will not accept racism and segregation and Jim Crowism. And when people stood up and fought back, we made progress in civil rights. And that is the history of the women's movement. And that is, a hundred years ago, women in America didn't even have the right to vote. But women all over the country stood up. Some died in the struggle. Some were jailed in the struggle. But they said, we will not accept being second-class citizens. And that is the history of the gay movement in America. Where in the face of massive opposition and discrimination and hatred, gay people said, we have the right to love whoever we want, regardless of their gender. And that's what struggle is about. Frederick Douglass said it, the great abolitionist. He said, if you want change and you think you could bring about change without struggle, you're kidding yourself. 
So what this campaign is about is not only fighting for a progressive agenda, but understanding we will not achieve that agenda unless millions of people look around them and say, the status quo is not acceptable. And when millions of people stand up and fight back, we will not be denied. Today, as part of that struggle, which I consider to be a human rights struggle, a civil rights struggle, today we say to the private health insurance companies, whether you like it or not, the United States will join every other major country on earth and guarantee health care to all people as a right. It is an international embarrassment that in America today we got 30 million people with no health insurance and even more who are underinsured with high deductibles and high copayments. And for all of that, we end up spending twice as much per capita on health care as do the people of any other nation. Now, the insurance companies are getting nervous. And they are prepared and will spend hundreds of millions of dollars to stop us. But we are going to win this struggle, and we will pass. We will pass a Medicare for all single payer program. And today we say to the pharmaceutical industry that you will no longer charge the American people the highest prices by far of any major country on earth. And while the five major drug companies made $50 billion in profit last year, unbelievably, one out of five Americans cannot afford to fill the prescriptions their doctors prescribe. How insane is that? Today, we say to Walmart and McDonald's and Burger King and all the other low-wage employers, stop paying your workers starvation wages. And yes, we are going to raise the federal minimum wage to a living wage, 15 bucks an hour. And by the way, because I believe that the future of the middle class is dependent on a growing and strong trade union movement, we are going to make it easier for workers to join unions, not harder. And let me take this opportunity to congratulate all of you who are trying to get a union here at the University of Pittsburgh. The University of Pittsburgh is a great academic institution. But I say to them, your greatness, your greatness lies not only on your research and your teaching. Your greatness lies on how you treat your employees. <laughs> Sit down and negotiate with your workers. And today, we say in Pennsylvania, 
as we have said all over this country, that we need a trade policy that works for working people and not just for the CEOs of multinational corporations. And that means, for starters, that we're going to stop corporations that outsource jobs overseas from receiving lucrative federal contracts. Let me give you an example of what I mean, because it's something that I literally experienced this morning. This morning I was in Lordstown, Ohio, where a large automobile plant owned by General Motors employing 1,600 workers was recently shut down and the work there was moved to Mexico. General Motors has also recently shut down auto plants in Michigan and Maryland. Let us be clear. Let us be clear. General Motors is a company that received a $50 billion bailout from the taxpayers in 2008. This is a company which over the last four years spent $25 billion buying back its own stock and paying out dividends to enrich its wealthy stockholders. This is a company that made over $4 billion in profits last year. This is a company that paid nothing in federal income tax last year. But despite all of that, this is a company which received over $600 million in federal contracts since Trump has been president. But it's really not just General Motors. It's many multinational corporations. And today, our message to General Motors and the other corporations is that you cannot continue to treat your employees with disdain and contempt. If you want a federal contract paid for by taxpayers, treat your workers with respect and dignity. No more paying your workers inadequate wages while you provide CEOs with multi-million dollar golden parachutes. No more taking away health care benefits. No more denying workers the right to form a union. And if you are not a good and responsible corporate citizen, do not think that you will get federal contracts. Today, we say to the young people in Pennsylvania, in Vermont, and across this country, we want you in a competitive global economy to get the best education that you can. <laughs> Clearly, it is hard to make it into the middle class without a higher education. And that is why we are going to do two very important things when together we are in the White House. Number one, we are going to make public colleges and universities tuition free. And number two, number two, we are going to stop punishing Americans for the crime of getting a higher education. We are going to substantially reduce student debt. Let me, let me ask you all a question. How many of you are dealing or will deal with student debt? I have talked to people 
all across this country who left college, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars in debt, left graduate school or medical school, three hundred thousand dollars in debt. Right there, okay. <laughs> Talk to a young woman who graduated dental school, four hundred thousand dollars in debt. Getting a higher education should not mean that people are saddled with unbearable debt for decades. And if Trump and his friends can give a trillion and a half dollar tax break to the top 1% and large private corporations, we can substantially reduce student debt in America. And today, you know, we say to Donald Trump, stop embarrassing us before the world. And Trump lies all the time and he says absurd things all of the time. But this is what galls me maybe the most and what is the most dangerous lie that he tells. So I say to Donald Trump and his friends in the fossil fuel industry, climate change is not a hoax. According, now we understand that as president we have a great scientist, a great genius, because that is what he tells us he is. But despite Donald Trump's views on the issue, what the scientific community tells us, and you all know this, is that climate change is caused by human activity. Climate change is already causing devastating harm in our country and all over the world. And what they tell us, which is really scary, is if we don't get our act together and significantly cut back on carbon emissions, there will be irreparable harm to this planet within the next 12 years. We have a moral responsibility to make certain to make certain that the planet we leave our children and grandchildren is a planet that is healthy and habitable. And that is, that is why together, that is why together we are going to stand up to the fossil fuel industry. We are going to transform our energy system here and lead the world in transforming international energy systems. We're going to move to energy efficiency. And we are going to invest heavily in sustainable energies like wind and solar. And by the way, by the way, when we do that, when we weatherize our buildings and our homes, when we create an energy efficient transportation system, when we build more wind turbines and solar panels, we are going to create millions of good paying jobs in America. And today, we say to the prison industrial complex that we will no longer tolerate having more Americans in jail than any other country on earth. Instead of spending $80 billion a year locking up fellow Americans, disproportionately African American, Latino, and Native American, Instead of spending money locking up people, we are going to invest in our young people, in jobs and education.
not more jails and incarceration. And when we talk about real criminal justice reform, I mean ending private prisons and detention centers. We're going to end the war on drugs, which has destroyed so many lives in this country. And we're no longer going to keep people in jail because they are too poor to afford cash bail. And today, we say that instead of demonizing the undocumented immigrants in this country, we are going to pass comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship. We are going to provide legal status to the 1.8 million young people eligible for the DACA program. And we are going to develop a humane border policy for those who seek asylum. America must never be about snatching babies from the arms of their mothers. And today we say to the military industrial complex, we need a strong defense, but we do not need to spend more money on defense than the next 10 nations combined. Together, we are going to invest in public education. We're going to invest in affordable housing. But we are not going to invest in never-ending wars. And today, we say to the top 1% and the large profitable corporations, people who have never had it so good that unlike Donald Trump, we are not going to give you huge tax breaks. Quite the contrary. You are going to begin to start paying your fair share of taxes. Now, there are a lot of candidates running for president, and I want to be as clear as I can be what together we are going to do when we are in the White House. Number one, we are going to establish a federal jobs guarantee. And what that means, what that means is there is an enormous amount of work to be done in this country. We need hundreds of thousands of child care workers. We need more teachers. We need to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. We need to transform our energy system. There is a lot of work to be done, and we will guarantee a job to every American who is prepared to do that work. Together, when we are in the White House, we are going to end the epidemic of gun violence in America. The American people want common sense gun safety legislation. And that is what we are going to give them. When we are in the White House, we are going to protect a woman's right to control her own body. I get sick and tired of hearing from my conservative colleagues who say over and over again, get the government out of the lives of the American people. Downsize government, small government. Well, if you believe in getting government out of the lives of the American people. Don't tell a woman what she can do with her own body.
Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, this campaign is not, as I said earlier, about just winning the Democratic nomination. It is not just about defeating Trump, as enormously important as that is. What this campaign and what our government must be about is transforming this country and creating the kind of nation that we know we can create. And when you hear this campaign, when you hear this campaign say that this campaign is not about me, but us, that is more than a bumper sticker. Because let me tell you what very few public officials will. And that is that no president, no matter how well-intentioned or honest he or she may be, can do it alone. And no president can do it alone because the power structure of America today is such that the special interests have so much power. And I'm talking about Wall Street. I'm talking about the insurance companies. I'm talking about the drug companies. I'm talking about the military industrial complex. I'm talking about agribusiness. I'm talking about the prison industrial complex. I am talking about the fossil fuel industry, among others. In other words, we have to understand the power that these people have. And we have to understand their greed in trying to preserve the status quo, which make the rich richer and richer. So what I am asking of you is something pretty difficult. I'm asking for your help on this campaign. I'm asking for your help in the general election to defeat Trump. But I am also asking, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, I am asking for your help. I need your help. We all need to work together. The day after the inauguration, we need to get to work. Now, I may not be a Nobel Prize winning mathematician. But this I do know. I do know because I have seen it for years. I have seen what the power of the 1% is, and I've seen the unlimited amounts of money they have to spend on ugly TV ads and campaign contributions and lobbying. I've seen it. But at the end of the day, the 1% are 1%. And at the end of the day, we are the 99%. So if we stand together in solidarity, if we don't allow Trump and his allies to divide us up, because some of us are black and some of us are white and some of us are Latino, and some of us are Asian American and some of us are Native American. If we don't allow Trump to divide us up because some of us are straight and some of us are gay. If we don't allow Trump to divide us up because some of us were born in America and some of us came to America. If we are prepared to stand up and keep our eyes on the prize, and that is creating an economy that works for the kids, that works for our parents, that works for working people. If we understand that in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, that when we stand together, there is nothing we cannot accomplish. So brothers and sisters, this is a pivotal moment in American history. We are fighting not only to win the election, we are fighting to preserve democracy against authoritarianism. We are not only fighting to win this election, 
We are fighting to save the planet. We're not only fighting to win this election, we're fighting to end racism and sexism and homophobia. So in this pivotal moment in American history, let us stand together. Let us not let anyone divide us up and let us go together and let us go forward to create the beautiful nation that we can become. Thank you all very much. Don't you worry about the swag Matter of fact, you can put it on my tab We counting every vote, they think they got it in the bag $27 and they still getting mad ah, So progressive and we never gonna let up Burn the establishment, I'm screaming from the neck up This is our time, this is our fight These are my kids, this is my life This ain't about the left, this ain't about the right Nobody cares if your mega hat's on tight Your little baby still yelling for the wall seal while the poor still trying to pay their light bill 40 hours got them begging for a living wage Vietnam vets still trying to see a better day Instead of crying in the ocean full of misery We gon' stand tall with the burn making history Senator Sanders stood up When he didn't have to stand up as a young man The way to define the character of a person is what they do When the cameras are not on, what they do when they don't be